On Monday, Holly Willoughby climbed onto the bus that had already destroyed Phil and reversed it back over his crumpled body again and again. If he wasn't quite dead when she started, he sure as hell was by the time she'd finished. Wearing an angelic white dress and talking through a gritted grin, Ms Willoughby ruthlessly dispatched what was left of Schofield's once glittering career to the scrap heap of TV history the smiling assassin, referring to her former best friend only once perfunctorily by name, before bizarrely bestowing they and them pronouns on a broken man she was meticulously annihilating on the very sofa where they pretended to love each other. A broken man who had spent the weekend posing for excruciatingly staged heartbreak pictures with his mother while briefing the press that he would not be watching Holly's return to the screen because it was still too painful for him to even hear the sickly sweet this morning theme tune. Deep breath began Holly while Phil wasn't watching, before plunging the knife in and twisting it fatally amid deadly denunciations of someone who was not telling the truth. And then the weird detached language, chronicling how they themselves felt they had to resign from ITV and step down from the career they loved. For clarification, caring, sharing, wonderful Willoughby was talking about Philip Schofield. Not they, not them, but one guy, he and him. It's equally hard to see the toll it's taken on their own mental health, she continued, strangely, apparently unaware that her devastating denunciation was guaranteed to take tortured Phil to an even darker dungeon of deep despair. With former friends like Holly, who needs enemies? Of course, this was the pivotal point where the remaining star of the This Morning psychodrama set out to save herself and to hell with the other guy. It was also the point where ITV's desperate producers and executives expected us to forgive, forget, and get back to beachwear, barbecues, and courageous kids, as if nothing had happened. Good luck with that, because the spectre of Philip Schofield will haunt that not-so-shiny show forever. But can they rescue it? The jury's out. The moment Holly's hollow oratory ended, co-host Josie Gibson purred, all we can do now is be the family we are. <laughs> Josie, this morning is a poisonous nest of vipers. It is not a family. Then another dash of Holly droning on about the warmth and magic that this show holds for us all. Really? All of us? Hardly. You can count me out of that for a start. And then, business as usual, over to a brave boy battling health problems and, of course, Master Chef John Tarode knocking up a Barbie prawn recipe. All comfortingly, reassuringly boring from a predictable programme cobbled together in the little house of seen them all before daytime telly cliches. But was it enough? Was writing Schofield out of the story and reducing him to a couple of grammatically incorrect pronouns all that was needed to close the book and move on? Do we trust that Holly knew nothing of Phil's inappropriate office romance with a male colleague 34 years his junior? Do we accept that the instant Scof looked into her eyes and emphatically denied the affair, Holly unquestioningly believed him, because a fair few of his other colleagues emphatically did not. One newspaper columnist dismissed Miss Willoughby as a conniving heap of blonde ambition whose protestations simply do not ring true, describing her as Saint Holly, Mother Superior of the Blind Eye Convent, an image that no amount of drivel about warmth, magic and family will ever dispel. Phil has gone. Many feel that for the sake of the damaged show, for this morning to survive, Holly must surely follow. But an enthusiastic fan of her own talents, Holly does not agree. She thinks she's the key. Maybe she's right, maybe she's wrong. But the question is, can a programme recover from lying to its own audience? Can, after a long deception, it ever retrieve its place in the viewers' hearts? Is this morning now a byword for fakery and deceit? And if, tarnished by her close association with Pariah Phil, Holly does have to walk the plank, will we call her they and them 
See how she likes it. With two parliamentary inquiries set to reignite this sizzling story, Phil, Holly and This Morning are starring in the most gripping soap opera on telly. Stay tuned for the next exciting episode. <laughs> You'll be watching, <laughs> won't you, JJ? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, kind of disgusting, really, seeing Holly on doing this whole... Yeah, he's gone. He, we loved him, but he lied to us. But they, sorry, love they. Them. We love them. <laughs> it, it's it's just tripe. He lied. She's now still lying to us. ITV are lying to us. We all know and suspect that they knew a lot more than they're letting on about. And Holly should go. She's got to go. The show cannot survive as long as she stays on that show because she is Philip Schofield. That's how close they were. Now, she would, of course, deny that she's lying, but course, let's uh, recall her return to the sofa on Monday morning. Take it away, Holly. You, me and all of us at this morning gave our love and support to someone who was not telling the truth, who acted in a way that they themselves felt that they had to resign from ITV and step down from a career that they loved. That is a lot to process. What Mary, that? Mary, you bring it in. Bring it <laughs> Thank in. Thank you. Bye. Eight of us. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I mean, the thing is, Amanda, <laughs> as Holly proves, that uh, in the world of television, in the glittering world of tele television, once you can fake sincerity, you got it made. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it, and it's that brazenness of being able to come on after everything that's been said uh, and actually say thanks for your lovely messages. I haven't seen one nice no, message. I've not seen a single um, one. And especially after after that speech, because everyone's been saying it's so insincere, um, that the fact that she's been able to come on there and basically throw her best friend of 17-odd mm. years under the bus yeah. as quick as that. I mean, I wouldn't throw you under the bus. You would. Oh, I would. Definitely unless, would. It was like a, <laughs> unless it's like a massive paycheck, <laughs> then, yeah, maybe, actually. I could um, <laughs> pay to do it. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, Amanda's right. I mean, as I said earlier, I mean, he was already under the bus. They, mm. ITV chucked him under the bus. This morning yeah. chucked him under the bus. Yeah. Uh, as I said, Holly just climbed aboard, got hold of the <laughs> steering wheel and reversed yeah. over <laughs> several times yes. to make sure he was properly yeah. dead. I mean, yeah. that was a ruthless destruction job. It, really yeah, it was. was. It was an assassination job, that was. Um, I don't feel sorry for Phil, but she is confused. She thinks that yeah. we're, all the viewers are at home like, oh, Philip, he's gone. We're so <laughs> shaken. How are we going to come out? No, we want him gone and we want you gone as well, Holly. You're <laughs> next. Then we'll all be fine. Their heads are going to roll. When the MPs get hold of them and all this comes out, they have got to step away because clearly, mm -hmm. just from a duty of care point of view, they did nothing. And it's the same network that go on all the time. Hashtag be kind, yeah. gotta be kind, let's all get back. That's the people. problem. Yeah, yeah, be, be kind to your big yeah. stars, be kind to your, your money makers. Yeah. Everyone else, shun them. I tell you. Uh, so uh, you can actually communicate uh, with people beyond the grave or when they're dead. So maybe we could get in touch with Phil. <laughs> uh, and uh, here is this week's bad ad. It's about a seance. <laughs> The seance is soon to begin. Everybody is gathered around the table, but there's one empty place. This is your chair. We'd like you to come and join us. Just call this number and be a part of the group. Isn't there somebody you'd like to talk to from your past? Call now and join Madam Ava's phone seance. Just $1.95 per minute for entertainment only under 18 get permission. There's a place at the table for you. Call now and speak to the past. You meant to... Uh, <laughs> I can, I can, I get yeah, I something. Think, I think we're, we're in touch. We're in touch. <laughs> yeah, but it's career. It is definitely yeah. dead. <laughs> As a dodo. <laughs> you know those that, that looked like a Da Vinci's Last Supper? Didn't yes. I? Only replaced by a bunch of dumb Americans <laughs> starring in an advert for a con about getting in touch with the dead. Yes, anti-social media. I get lots and lots of tweets, Facebook uh, messages, uh, all denouncing me uh, as something <laughs> terrible. They're probably right. Uh, here's a selection. Here's the three highlights of the week. Uh, here's one. Does Kevin O'Dullivan... <laughs> That's good, That's good. That's good. Very clever. <laughs> That's a very clever play on words. Does Kevin O'Dullivan ever watch his own... Show. Well, not really, because I'm on it. Uh, it's the TV equivalent of rubbing sand into the eyes of starving children and making them fight to the death over scraps of gammon. It's really thought Thanks. about that one. Yeah? From Mike Graham. <laughs> Whoever wrote that, I mean, they need help. Uh, they really need yeah. help.
Uh, right, here's the next one. Another clever play on words, I think you'll agree. Yeah. Kevin O. Oh, <laughs> the, the things you can do with an O and an apostrophe, the uh, possibilities are endless. Anyway, Kevin O. House <laughs> needs to calm down and watch his <laughs> blood pressure. He is not a young man. You got that right. Uh, he is so obsessed with migrant hotels. Why doesn't he <laughs> stay in one? Well, because I'm not a migrant. <laughs> I don't need to, but uh, very uh, astute comments. Thank you very much. Uh, pardon me, this one's actually used my name without a play on words. Oh. So here we go. Kevin O'Sullivan <laughs> claims to be a professional journalist, but is just an ignorant <laughs> working, <laughs> working, working for Bill Gates. <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm a, I might be an ignorant, <laughs> but I'm not yeah. working for Bill Gates. Uh, talk TV should replace him with Philip Schofield. <laughs> Why not? I tell you, they tune in. What, what just happened? That's Philip Schofield. Yeah. So I would love to see well? that. I do, yeah. Um, and I'm glad that we've got some new nicknames oh, way, for you. That's what I need. JJ need. lies. I never get any bad tweets. I don't. I just get. I I look at it. Right. I'm going anyway, to be tweeting. I'm going to be you in the future. <laughs> okay. So um, the first one is like a current theme. It's just everyone says this. Really, who the <laughs> is Amanda Devlin? Yeah. Fair. <laughs> Is Amanda Devlin? And why is she on this show? Yeah. Who is she? Who is she? I was asking so I'm that sure that I'll question. get loads of. <laughs> well, they said we've got Amanda Devlin. <laughs> Amanda Devlin could be and will be an ugly old woman. <laughs> but I feel like it's, I'm going to. psychic. But I've got time to get plastic surgery. I've got time to sort this out. Like, it's not that big a deal. Oh, time's running out for plastic yeah. surgery for me. <laughs> Hello, is that the plastic surgeon? This is an emergency. Yeah. 999. We're going to go to a proper break now. Uh, stay tuned. What just happened? He's mad as hell. It's Kevin O'Sullivan. We're used to the consistent background noise of the migrant crisis, the shambolic mess of it all, the fury of the British people who just want their sovereign borders sealed, the impotence of a government stunned into powerlessness by an escalating catastrophe it can neither control nor solve. We're used to the images the migrant crisis produces, images we would once have considered shocking, to the point of scarcely believable. Thousands of foreigners sailing dangerously and illegally across the channel from France in small boats and dinghies, landing on our beaches and demanding to stay. Mostly young men given warm clothing, sun cream, pizzas, before being piled onto luxury coaches and driven to hotels for a new life in the United Kingdom. We're used to, to the announcements, Suella's solutions, Rishi's big plans, Rwanda. We're used to shrugging our shoulders and not expecting anything to change because it never does. Things just get worse. And so we just crack on and leave the pathetic politicians to pretend they're any match for the massed ranks of the immigration lawyers who have turned the UK into a sanctuary for asylum seekers taking years, sometimes decades, to process. 90,000 applications are currently in the works. 60,000 migrants are staying in 450 hotels the length and breadth of the country at a cost of £7 million a day. Derelict prisons and air bases are being turned into vast accommodation centres. Barges are becoming floating campuses for foreigners who get 45 quid a week welfare and free food courtesy of the long-suffering British taxpayers. This ocean-going disaster has become the norm. When the Prime Minister insisted this week that his stop the Boats initiative was working, millions of us rolled our eyes and laughed at the sheer absurdity of his empty nonsense. It isn't working. Of course it's not working. It's not even anywhere close to working. So we leave simpering Sunak to his tedious task forces, to his mysterious half billion pound gift to France to allegedly patrol its own beaches, to his Rwanda scheme that never got off the ground, and to his strange delusion that somehow 
he's on the case, that somehow his uselessness at confronting the crisis won't lose him the next election. Meanwhile, away from planet Westminster, down here in the real world, we watch open-mouthed as the migrant crisis enters astonishing new uncharted territory. Now they're staging angry protests over the standard of the hotels they're not paying for, over the size of the bathrooms, the smell in the corridors, the quality of the Wi-Fi, none of which are up to their required standards. And so, in the stylish streets of Pimlico, one of London's most exclusive areas where houses can easily fetch £10 million, moaning migrants brandish their banners, demanding a better free hotel, demanding less crowded conditions, demanding Wi-Fi that works. Luckily, it seems the free food they're given is to their liking. But pass me that tiny violin... Everything else is not, and the disgruntled guests are not happy. These extraordinary scenes of rampant entitlement unfolded outside the £150 a night three-star comfort inn. And you'll be thrilled to learn that from this bitter dispute over the awful way they're being treated, our vigilant visitors emerged triumphant. They received guarantees that from now on they will no longer be forced to endure more than two people to a room. Something will be done about the unpleasant aroma and engineers will be brought in to fix the Wi-Fi. Isn't that special? If ever you wanted a sign that the migrant crisis is insanely out of control, look no further than the Comfort Inn in Pimlico, where one of the protesters pointed out that he's been in Britain at our expense for two years. He alone has cost us more than £110,000. There are nearly 100,000 more just like him and rising, racking up this enormous bill without end. But maybe... The next time any of our migrant friends decide they are unsatisfied with the hotel they have been provided with, we tell them to find a superior hotel, more to their liking, perhaps four or five star, rather than a mere three. And hey, call me controversial. How about this? They pay for it them damn selves. There you go, Dave. JJ, I wrote that just for you. Yeah. Yeah, well Did it annoy you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, good, did, good. Did annoy me, yeah, well done, well done. No, 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 <laughs> I mean, you know, I know you, you and I don't see eye to eye on this. This isn't, again, I'm not having a go at the migrants. I'm having a go at this absurd firestorm of insanity that we're trapped in. Rishi Sunak this week, standing up and saying, I'm really solving this crisis. Yeah. I'm stopping the boats. No, you're not. Yeah, yeah. no, you're not. You're bringing in more barges. I yeah, think, bringing um, in more boats. Yeah, <laughs> I think um, you're, you're right about our government are failing on their promise to, to stop uh, or reduce migration. But the asylum seekers who are in these hotels, you don't want to be living in a room that's for one person with four people in. And, and the wife, I know it seems trivial to say, well, the Wi-Fi doesn't work, but actually they're not allowed to work. So essentially, they're stuck in this hotel room with three other people without Wi-Fi, without the connectivity to the world. They just sat there on their, like, you know, twiddling their thumbs. You, you would go insane. It's like being in a prison. The government are not allowing any of these migrants to get jobs until they're... they're uh, papers are processed, which is taking two, three years, which is nuts. The sad yeah. thing is I've had to stay in these kind of grotty hotels from having a night <laughs> over grotty. in London. And like, I've had to actually pay the £150 for the privilege to do yeah, so. So the yeah. fact that they, they're getting it <laughs> pay, for free, you, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting concept. <laughs> Who the f*** is, is Amanda that? Devlin? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, soon. Give them a call. <laughs> you can stay there free. Uh, now it's time uh, for Vote For Me. And this is especially for you. Uh, it's a Labour Party uh, past <laughs> political broadcast back in 1996. Just for you, JJ. Wherever you go, the 22 Tory tax rises are never far behind. But it's hard-working people who suffer most. While the Conservatives look after the fat cats, like gas and water company bosses, the rest of us have nowhere to hide. We have to work longer hours just to pay for the 22 Tory tax rises. Enough is enough. 
Well, I'll tell you what, I, I've got a lot of sympathy for that because old Rishi's been responsible for 14 tax rises since yeah. he was Chancellor. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that the uh, chorus hasn't is still changed. the same. Exactly, exactly. They all were ahead of the they, game. But that that's, so, that's so depressing, all that time later. <laughs> it's still oh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very dramatic way to, to hammer it home. But yeah. as, as we say, that was 1996. And today, mm. the Tories are still doing the same thing. We're, 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 you're talking about the cost of living crisis. Yeah. And the Tories are, are not going to put a, a windfall tax on any of these big energy companies. We're still the ones suffering. Yeah, yeah, it's like, hey, Rishi, if you're watching, uh, Tories, that's the party of low tax. <laughs> Stop putting our taxes up, because if you do that, you won't get voted back in. And you put it up 14 times already, so yeah. I wouldn't be uh, sizing up the curtains in number 10 Downing Street for a change of decor anytime soon. What do you mean, if he's watching? He's obviously of watching he's and watching. he's taking notes. The cabinet I mean... will be sat around. <laughs> This yeah. is required viewing. I'll be sat around going, I know Kevin, <laughs> yeah. I know JJ, but who the, who the f is a man of the devil? In fact, Rishi Sunak's the one who said <laughs> oh, that. Too. Yeah. Uh, now it's time for the best of bad TV again. <laughs> We all like balloons, don't we? You know, they're great fun at the party. Uh, this, this, <laughs> guy, this guy, uh, his love of balloons... Wrong time to take a drink. It's kind of disturbing. Let's have a look. <laughs> Julius has been addicted to balloons for over five decades. It started when he was a child as an innocent attraction to the shapes and colours. Now Julius has filled his home with over 50,000 balloons and can't sleep unless he's surrounded by them. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> So we watched this earlier and I said, I, um, I, he looks like the kind of guy who doesn't have a wife and kids. Yeah. Uh, now, if There's no at, room for if them. If you look at the next uh, advert, uh, I think it confirms my contention. Take it away. Julius's obsession with balloons goes beyond shapes and colours. My love for balloons, it's also a sexual love. When I see a, a beautiful balloon, my heart starts to flutter and I get aroused. I'll take a 12 inch and I'll inflate it to 11 inch. That way, it can take a lot of abuse. I'm holding one, you know, hugging it. I'll kiss it, and it's like being in heaven. I mean, don't you like to hug and kiss the woman that you love? <laughs> yeah, oh but that's not the same gosh. as hugging and kissing a balloon. No. And it, so he keeps the pressure low, <laughs> yeah. because then it can take... A, did you hear what he said? Yeah. He keeps the pressure abuse. low so it can take a lot of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to put a public plea. Check that man's hard drive. Yeah. Check it oh. now. I'm telling you, there's, there's, there's something not quite right about that geezer. And Amanda, how long have you been going out with him? <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I was going to say. That is you're in, get genuinely. <laughs> that is the kind of that's what's that's in the, the dating pool. This is like. <laughs> Thank you very much to uh, my regular guest, JJ Anasiobi, <laughs> who uh, I doubt if I will succeed in preventing from coming next week. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much, assistant ed showbiz editor at the Sun, yeah. Amanda Tilly. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll be back next week. That's it for What Just Happened. What Just Happened?